Jesus, the baby that we just saw in the manger there. Uh, Jesus has been more admired, but at the same time more misunderstood than any other character in history. Jesus has been seen as an imposter, a heretic. Others have seen him as a good teacher. Some as a victim, some as an idealist, or a prophet, or even a homeboy, or God himself. These have all been different ways that people have defined Jesus in all their contradictory understandings of him. Jesus has been one and was one who talked about love and epitomized what love looks like, but at the same time, Jesus talked about hell more than anybody else in the Bible, something Paul didn't even bring up. Jesus played with children, but at the same time, Jesus hung out with prostitutes and people from Revenue Canada. Jesus also called many of the religious people some of his harshest terms. Snakes, brood of vipers, hypocrites, whitewashed tombs, and even said that their father is the devil. It would have been tough to be a religious leader in Jesus' day because some of his toughest words were for them. Jesus also believed in a literal devil and evil spirits. He appeared to talk to spirits that had possessed certain people. He healed blind people. He healed paralyzed people. He took people who were blind and gave them back their sight. And same with people that couldn't hear, that could now hear. And yet, healing all of these people, even raising people from the dead, Jesus himself died on a cross. Many people even mocking him in his day. How can you raise other people from the dead? How can you do all of these wonderful things and then you can't even protect your own life? Jesus' own family at one point thought that he was going a bit mental. Jesus had no home. Jesus never married. Jesus was always on the move and always seemed to be ruffling people. He was challenging things, challenging the status quo. Jesus was pushing people's buttons and probing deeper. And so he's been one of the most admired and also one of the most misunderstood people in all of history. Jesus is one of those people that as soon as you think you've got Jesus figured out, He confuses you and lets you know how little you know about him. So many of Jesus' teachings have these paradoxes and are as much revealing as they are concealing. When people ask Jesus questions, he rarely gave a straight answer, but often told stories or asked them questions back. Jesus is one who builds our faith, And shakes our faith. And often shakes our faith so that he can build our faith. When a rich man came to Jesus and was more than happy to tithe well over 10% and be a follower of Jesus, Jesus said, you must sell everything you have if you want to follow me. And we read that the man went away sad. When a crowd came to Jesus and wanted to make Jesus their king, you would think that was one of the most honoring things they could do for Jesus, to make him their king. Jesus then goes and gives the weirdest sermon about cannibalism and says, sure, I will be your king if you eat my flesh and drink my blood. And once again, we read that most of the people in the crowd left at that point. When a religious teacher once in the middle of the night came to Jesus and asked Jesus to show him what the kingdom of God was like, and he appears to be sincerely wanting to know these things, Jesus said, you have to go through the birth process once again. To which the man thought, not only is that crazy and impossible, but disgusting. Who is this Jesus? Do we really know him? Or does Jesus himself sometimes become an idol of our own beliefs, our own religiosity, of our own customs and our own traditions? Jesus, that we meet in the Gospels, refuses to fit into any formulas. 
A number of years back, Philip Yancey pointed this out in his book called The Jesus I Never Knew. Some people may have read that book. I know a lot of different small groups and people went through that book back then. And that's exactly what he was pointing out in that book. That this Jesus in the gospel is a Jesus that many of us don't really know. We know more about Jesus by hearsay than what actually has been written about him in the gospels and what he said about himself. And Jesus will not allow himself to be mastered. He will not allow you to define who he is. Unlike what the grandma in this Pickles comic may have been doing during her Bible reading. When she was reading her Bible, her, one of her grandchildren saw her and came up to grandma and said, Grandma, what are you doing? And she responded by saying, well, Nelson, I am reading my Bible. I do this regularly. It's an important thing to do. And Nelson said, no, Grandma, what are you doing with that marker in your hand? And uh, Grandma said, oh, well, what I'm doing, Nelson, is I'm, I'm highlighting all my favorite passages, all the passages that really speak to me. And Nelson said, really? Well, when I asked Grandpa about it, he said that you were crossing out all the sections you didn't like. <laughs> Sometimes that's what we do with Jesus. It's what we do with our Bible. We cross out those things that we don't like, that don't quite fit in. So Jesus comes to us with this question. A question that he has asked from the day that he walked on this earth, and he's continuing to ask today. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, when Jesus used that term, Son of Man, it's important for us to understand that he was referring to himself. He wasn't talking about somebody else. A son of man at, at one level simply means a human being. Uh, there also, though, if you look back in Daniel 7, the term son of man also was a term associated with the Messiah. But we're not going to get into some of those nuances, which also do directly refer to Jesus as well. Uh, but for our purposes, what it's important for us to recognize is he was referring to himself. I am the son of man. So when Jesus says, who are people saying the Son of Man? Who are people saying this title that, that I'm using for myself? Who are people saying that I am? Who are people saying today? When you listen to the, or watch the, the latest movie about Jesus, or at Easter time or Christmas, Time Magazine, McLean's, different pl uh, publications like that tend to put something like that on the cover about Jesus and some supposed new discovery. Who are they saying? What are the latest talk shows saying about who Jesus is? Who are you saying Jesus is? This has been a question that people have tried to answer since the time he first asked it. Well, just like all of the plethora of answers that people give today the same thing happened in jesus day so when he asked his disciples this they said back to him well some are saying john the baptist maybe some kind of weird reincarnation something or uh, maybe uh, john was he had two different costumes and now he you're just actually john with a different costume on or all kinds of different things like that uh, so some are saying john the baptist maybe he came back to life and, and it's you Others are saying Elijah. Maybe Elijah's come back and that's who you are. So others are saying Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. These are some of the theories out there that people are coming up with. Well, others are saying a great moral teacher today. Some are simply saying he's a swear word. Or maybe someone who got in touch with his inner goddess. But what about you personally, Jesus directs the question. Okay, that's what social media, that's what all those other pundits out there, that's what everybody is saying about me. But what about you? When you look at my life, when you hear my teachings, when you follow me, who do you say that I am? That's very personal. Who do you, Barb, Norm, Kevin, Kathy, Margaret, or Steph, who do you say that I am? And that's when Simon Peter 
piped up and said, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. That confession of Peter, that confession of Peter is what Jesus said the church will be built upon. Peter, your confession is what the church for 2,000 years will continue to acknowledge and say, yes, that is who I am. Which is why when we get back to the Apostles' Creed, the second stanza after that we believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth that we talked about last week, the next stanza says, we believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Notice how that's exactly Peter's confession. Who do you say that I am, Peter? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So what do we confess? The very foundation upon which Jesus said the church would be built, Peter's confession, that you are the Christ, the Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. You, that's who you are, Christ, Son, and Lord. But what do these terms mean? What do these terms mean biblically? Because we can put all kinds of different definitions to the terms, and sometimes the definitions that we put to these terms are not the correct definition of what the Scripture means. So what does it say, and what do we confess when we say Jesus is the Christ? Now notice how I even said that. Jesus is the Christ. When I was... In my second year of college, I ran a kids' club called Patch the Pirate Club. And this uh, was a kids' club for community kids that were in the neighborhood, and the neighborhood kids would come out. Most of them were not churched, and this was a way to engage the kids and tell them about Jesus and to let them know about the church. So during Patch the Pirate Club, all the kids called me pastor. And we would do these fun games and activities, and we started to learn some Christmas songs. For some of these kids, it was the first time they learned Christmas songs. And at Christmas time, we thought, let's have an event where we invite all of these kids and their families, who are all unchurched, to come to church for a Christmas event. And through the songs the kids learn, tell the Christmas story and introduce these people to Jesus. So that's what we did, and there was this one kid that really kind of attached himself to me, and at this Christmas event, after it was over, he said, you've got to meet my mom. You really have to meet my mom. And so I went over, and he dragged me over to his mom, and he said, mom, mom, this this is Mr. Steph. And I was like, that's weird. He always called me pastor at all of the Patch the Pirate Clubs all the time, and now all of a sudden he's like calling me Mr. Steph which was also kind of weird. And so he's like, Mom, this is Mr. Steph, and Mr. Steph does this, and Mr. Steph. So I just went with it, and then the next Patch the Pirate Club, I went to this young guy, and I said to him, why did you call me Mr. Steph to your mom? He said, well, I thought it would be rude to refer to you by your first name to my mom. And I said, but Steph is my first name. And he's like, his eyes just got really big. He said, really? I thought your first name was Pastor. So for all this time, and this just shows how unchurched some of these kids were, for all this time, whenever they heard Pastor Steph, this kid thought that was my first and last name. Well, some people think about this when it comes to Christ, that Christ is Jesus' last name, as if his parents were, were Joseph and Mary Christ. But Jesus is not, or Christ is not a last name of Jesus. That's why we properly can refer to him as Jesus the Christ. Christ is a title for Jesus. And it's a title that tells us something about who he is in his role. Just like pastor is a title that I have, it tells you something about my role. So when we refer to Jesus as the Christ, when we hear Peter saying, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, he's not confessing, I've discovered your last name. He's saying, you are the promised one from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they believed that God was going to send his people a Messiah. A Messiah, which means Savior. 
Well, Christ is simply the Greek word of Messiah. Messiah, the Hebrew, now translated to Greek, is Christ. So when you say Jesus the Christ, it's exactly the same thing as saying Jesus the Messiah. It's just using a Greek term rather than a Hebrew term. And what the Messiah, or what the Christ means, is anointed one and Savior. So when Peter said, you are the Christ, you are the Son of the living God, what Peter was confessing is, you are the anointed Savior that God has promised us from long ago. That one has finally come in you. And that is what the church stands upon as well. We acknowledge that Peter got that right. Jesus said Peter got that right. And that's why the church continues to stand and has continued to proclaim for 2,000 years, we believe that Jesus is the anointed Savior, the anointed Messiah Christ of God who's come to save people from their sin, from darkness, from hell, from death, from disease. He is the Savior. But what about this next part of the confession in the creed and what Peter also said, you are the Savior, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. What does that phrase mean when we confess that Jesus is the Son of God? He's the Christ and he's the Son of God. There's probably no term that has been more misunderstood than this one in relation to Jesus. And that's because we've taken the term son and we have interpreted it in a very human way of understanding it in relation to how biology works with all of us. And so when we have a son, it's when a husband and a wife, they come together and through their union, they then birth a son. But that's not what the Bible means by Son of God when it refers to Jesus. It's again a title. These are titles for Jesus. It's not speaking about Jesus' chronology, that there was a time that there was the Father without the Son. Jesus was always in existence. Jesus was always the Son, which also means the Father was always the Father. There was never a time the Father was not the Father. And then had Jesus, or created Jesus, and then became the Father with the Son, Jesus. In the fact that the Son and the Father share the same nature, one aspect of the nature of God is that He's eternal. So the Son and the Father are equally eternal in their nature. So the Son has always been the Son. The Father has always been the Father. So it's a title referring to their relationship between Father and Son. Speaking of Jesus, Paul even says in Colossians 1.17 that He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. This tells us one thing about Jesus. Jesus is not a thing. That's important for us. A lot of times when we think about God, we think about God in the same categories of the categories that we live in. And so there's all these things in the universe, and God is just another one of these things in the universe. He's just the greatest thing in the universe. But truthfully, He is outside of thingness. He's not anything in this. He is the one who created everything. He is a completely different entity. And so all things come from God. And before all things, Jesus was. And all things not only came after Jesus because he's eternal, but all things bind and hold themselves together because God's not only the creator, he is also the sustainer of everything. Everything is bound together and held together and works together because of the sustaining holdingness of God. So that's the category that Jesus is in. 
Son of God then means he is the, an eternal relationship with the Father. Now you may ask, but aren't we also sons and daughters of God? So then how does that work? Because we're things. Well, the answer to that is that yes and no. We are sons and daughters of God, but we are not sons and daughters of God the way that Jesus is. Jesus is the Son of God in nature. He shares the nature of God. We don't. We're a creation of God. So therefore, all people are a creation of God. Those that then come and bow their knee to their Creator, they become sons and daughters of God, but they become sons and daughters of God by adoption. Different than Jesus, who is the Son of God by nature. We become part of that family. He adopts us into the family, but we are not of the same nature of the Father. Only Jesus is God's, and that's why the creed tries to emphasize that by saying he is God's only Son. Only Son by nature. The Nicene Creed, which is based on the Apostles' Creed, tries to really emphasize this to make sure that people understand, because even back in the three and four hundreds, people were mistaking this, and there was the Arian heresy back then, which is very similar to what the Jehovah Witnesses believe today. And so to really shore this up and helping them understand what this term Son of God means, in the Nicene Creed, it describes Jesus as Son of God, meaning God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. And in other words, he is, he shares the nature of the Father. Though he is a distinct person, he shares the same nature. So that's why he could say in John 10, I and the Father are one. At which we read, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. They knew exactly what he was claiming. The Jews picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus said to them, I've shown you many great miracles from my Father. Why are you wanting to stone me? And listen to what the religious leaders say. They say, we're not stoning you for any of these miracles that you've done, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. You, a mere man, claim to be God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. And that's blasphemous, and that's deserving of death. That's why we're picking up stones to stone you. See, Jeremiah never claimed that. Elijah never claimed that. John the Baptist, Moses... One of our greats, Abraham, the father of our people. Nobody ever made a claim like that. Here we obviously run into the mystery of the triune nature of God. That is, that Jesus is the Son of God, but a separate person from the Father and the Holy Spirit. And yet, these three distinct, separate people in the Trinity are one God. They share the nature of the one essence of the eternality, omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience, all of those attributes of God, they share as one. This is something that we can never fully put our minds around. How God is three distinct persons. When Jesus was dying on the cross and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He wasn't not talking to himself. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was not praying to himself. He is distinct from the Father. And yet they are of the same God essence. Both eternal. 100% unified. What the Trinity does help us understand is the nature of who God is. See, because the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all co-eternal, there's never been a time where one of them was not. They are all 
always have been in a relationship with one another. The relationship that binds them together is that they've been in an eternal love relationship. That's why when the Bible talks about God, it doesn't say that love is an attribute of God. It says God is love. His very inner being is love. God was not lonely and then decided, I need some company, and so he created human beings. God was completely before anything in creation. He was completely self-contained and had complete unity and love. And therefore, he created out of that love. It was complete love that he created, complete grace from which he created out of. And therefore, we also understand when God made us in his image... Part of what we see is when he made us in his image, it doesn't then talk about humanity as solo, and then he made Adam. It says that God made us, us, in God's image, and then he created them male and female. He created them. That we reflect the image of who God is in community. We're not meant to be solo. In fact, it's even been shown in studies that when people are completely isolated, the whole Robinson Crusoe story, in fact, when I read Robinson Crusoe a number of years back, there was a sort of a preface before it of somebody had done some modern studies, and they said the book actually cannot happen in in real life. There have been over time, real Robinson Crusoe type people that were discovered lost on an island. And just after two or three years, most of those people that were discovered had lost their ability to speak. They had, they had gone crazy. We, we actually can't live in complete isolation with no community. We cannot actually function. It physically messes us up. So when we are made in God's image, we're made for love, We're made for love with him. We're made for love with one another. The image of God is not a solo human being. The image of God is us in perfect loving community because it reflects the nature of who God is. So though we do not understand how God is Trinity, how does this actually work? We don't understand that because God is beyond our nature and how we work, we don't understand it, but we do understand that the nature of Trinity tells us something very essential to the character of God. And that is, is that He is a God of love. So when we confess that Jesus is His only Son, we are talking about a title and about the nature of Jesus as one with the Father, as one God. But we also say in the creed that we believe that Jesus is our Lord. These are very strong terms. The creed is very concise, but every word and every term is packed with truth because they're trying to put it all in an easy way to remember these things. So we say that, that he's the Savior, He's the Messiah, the Christ. We are saying he's the Son of God, sharing the nature with the Father of the one true God and is in a perfect love relationship so that God is love. But when we say and confess that Jesus is Lord, we're saying another title. What's interesting is in the Old Testament, the word for Lord was Kyrios. And that word was then translated into the Greek when they did the Septuagint, and that was translating the the Old Testament from Hebrew into the Greek. They used the word Adonai for Lord. That's the English. I guess Lord's the English. So you have Kyrios in the Hebrew, which is translated as Adonai. Now, obviously, in the Old Testament, Kyrios for Lord is always referring to God when they refer to Kyrios, they're referring to Lord God. Well, that term then translated into the Greek, referring to God, is Adonai. We refer to him as Adonai. In the New Testament, the New Testament writers who wrote after the Septuagint was translated use the exact same term Adonai whenever they referred to Jesus as Lord. It's the same term. 
So the same terminology that is referred to God in the Old Testament is the terminology referred to Jesus in the New Testament. They're equating them. When we say Jesus is Lord, in other words, we are confessing that he is Adonai. He is the Yahweh that the people of Israel were worshiping and following in the Old Testament. And so in the creed, we are not just acknowledging him as Lord, we are confessing him as our Lord. We are saying that Jesus is our God. He's the one we worship and bow to. In the first century, and even throughout church history as well, this is also a very loaded political term. Because Lord, Adonai, was used for Caesar. Caesar was Adonai. In fact, what's interesting is a lot of these are politically loaded terms because Caesar was also seen as the Savior, the Christ. So that's how they saw. Caesar was Savior of the people. Caesar was Lord. Caesar was the one who was a son of God. It actually was even on the Roman coinage where it would have Augustus, son of God. So all of these terms are also very politically loaded terms because what the church is saying is not only are they acknowledging the God of the Old Testament is the same one that is found in Jesus, it's also an anti-political statement because when you say Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus is Lord, what you are automatically also saying is that Caesar is not the Christ, Caesar is not the Son of God, and Caesar is not our Lord. That's one of the big reasons that Christians were killed and seen as anarchists. And again and again and again throughout history under all kinds of regimes, it's been these kinds of confessions where Christians have refused to bow to any kind of ideology or any kind of governmental system that tries to set itself up as Lord. It's also why Christianity is the true faith of real freedom. Because we have a reason to say, I will not bow to any human authority. Not even the church or the pope, as the reformers would say. Because the true Lord of all is Jesus himself. He's the only one I pledge allegiance to... Anybody else that demands that kind of an allegiance, we say no to. That's what the creed is saying. And that's why the creed, sometimes in comfortable situations and settings, uh, can be words we just rattle off out of our mouth and we're kind of comfortable. Uh, but it's these kinds of statements that have cost people their lives. Jesus is the only one we surrender to. He's more important than our future, more important than our family, more important than our finances, more important than our friends, even more important than our faith. Paul writes in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the most important confession that you could ever make. Jesus is Lord. And he's not making it in some kind of arrogant, intolerant way. He's making the statement because it's basic truth. What he's saying is that everything else you try to fill in that line with, if you take the Jesus out of that and just fill in something, is Lord, every other thing will, will fail you. Every other Lord will let you down. Tons of those other lords become monsters. And that's why he is saying, the only thing that will truly save you, the only thing that will set you free is the truth. And Jesus is the only Lord, truthfully, because he's the only eternal one. All other lords are mortal. And so by confessing Jesus is Lord, believing 
that he is so immortal, that he is so bound up with the eternality of God, that even death could not defeat him. He raised from the dead. You too will be saved because you, by confessing him as Lord, you bind yourself to the immortal one. And guess what gets thrown in when you're bound to the immortal one? is the gift of immortality. Which is why those who believe in Him shall inherit eternal life. Because you now are bound to the one who death cannot defeat. So, when we are confessing the creed, what we are saying in these first few statements is we are saying that we believe that Jesus is the Christ. He is the anointed Messiah who has come to save people from sin and from Satan from death, from darkness, he's the Savior. When we confess the creed and we say that Jesus is God's only Son, we are confessing that Jesus is united with his Father, and together they are the one true God whose very nature is love. When we confess that Jesus is Lord, we are saying that Jesus is the only God to whom we surrender everything about ourselves to. In other words, we are saying in the confession that Jesus is Savior, Jesus is God, and Jesus is King. That's what we're confessing. Savior, God, and King. Unlike all the other, these are very, not only with Rome, but these were very common ways that people in the ancient world saw their rulers. Their rulers were supposed to be gods, kings, and saviors. And yet, almost all of them brutalized their people. Only the true God, king, and savior sets people free. But then we have in today's statement, one more line that brings us to our Christmas song, and that is that we also confess that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. So what is this saying? What's the point of this statement? Well, here we are acknowledging that Jesus became a true human being. This is where Jesus was not always human. Jesus was always God, but he was not always human. Jesus is the true human one, and yet there's something interesting about how he became human, and that is that he was supernaturally conceived. We read in the Gospels that Mary was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. When the angel announced that Mary would have a child, she recognized This and said, how can this be, Mary asked, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God, for nothing is impossible with God. Now it's important to understand here that what is going on in this is it's not suggesting, as happened in a lot of pagan mythology, that Mary somehow had sex with God. It's not at all what it is saying. This common pagan myth where gods made it with human women and then through that relationship they birthed demigods. That's where a lot of our mythology comes from and Hercules and all these different stories. It's because of Zeus or different gods mating with with human women and having demigods. But that's not what this text is saying. In fact, it goes out of its way to tell you that it's not saying this by the very fact that it emphasizes that Mary was a virgin. So if she would have had some kind of union with a, with a God, she wouldn't be a virgin anymore. So the very text is emphasizing that she was a virgin, and in fact she remained a virgin up until the very conception and birth of Jesus. She had never slept with any man or God when she gave birth to Jesus. And therefore, Jesus was not a demigod. Jesus was a human one, not a half-breed. 
But some of you may say, but how is that possible? If he didn't have the normal union, how could he have been a possible, uh, an actual human? Well, the, the text as we read it is bringing us back to the beginning of Genesis. Remember at the beginning of Genesis, it talks about the Holy Spirit hovering over the, the sort of non-creation, and it's through the Holy Spirit that creation and, and God, the Father, and the, and the Son, as we read, it, before all things, and then all things were created through Him, and the hovering of the Spirit over the waters, creation comes into being, and Adam and Eve are created. And Adam and Eve are created because of God's special, creative bringing things into being. Adam and Eve were not not human because they were created by a special intervention of God. Well, that's exactly what's happening with Jesus. It says, like Mary, kind of like the waters, the Holy Spirit comes and, and, and hovers over Mary, and in the same creative, supernatural way from the beginning, Jesus becomes the new Adam. He is created in some ways out of nothing, in God's creative breathing into being. Adam was a human. Jesus is human like Adam. He becomes human just like humanity started. And that's what is happening here, is that we see in this statement, we believe that Jesus, born of the Virgin Mary, it's saying that he did not appear to be human. He didn't just walk around with with a mask on. Uh, Some people refer incorrectly to Jesus as God in a bod. He wasn't God in a bod. He was human. Yes, he continued to be God in his nature. He had two natures, but was one person. Again, a mystery. But his very DNA, everything about him, was human. It wasn't just Steph in a car. Like, if, if, it's, if it's God in a bot or Steph in a car, I have not become the car. I'm just driving the car around. God did not enter into a body and then drive the body around. And he actually incarnated. It would be like me becoming the car. That's what happened with Jesus. And that's what this is saying, that Jesus was not a half-breed, was not a demigod through any kind of sexual union, was not someone that was born into the human elements of sin, like everybody since Adam and Eve. He was a special 100% human creation of God like at the beginning of time and became human 2,000 years ago. That's what we're saying. So in the creed, what we are affirming is that Jesus, as the Son of God, always existed. Mary never slept with any man, God, before she gave birth to Jesus. But through a miracle of the Holy Spirit, Jesus became a human being, was conceived in Mary's womb while Mary was a virgin, and Jesus was born then a real human being, lived a real human life, and yet without sin. And when we say yet without sin, that's not meaning, well, then he wasn't really human, because sin is not what makes us human. Sin is actually a defect on our humanity. So one simple thing you can even correct in your own uh, terminology is next time you you mess up or sin, don't say, well, I'm only human. Because that's actually incorrect. Because Adam and Eve, before they sinned, were completely human. They didn't like eat from the fruit and then say, oh, we're human now. Now we're human because now we... They were fallen humans at the time they sinned. They were only human without sin. And that's the hope of us. The hope is that because Jesus showed us once again true humanity, because sin is not part of true humanity, our salvation is that we will one day become human again in the resurrection. We will be human the way we are intended to be. That is without sin. Sin is not supposed to be part of humanity. 
It's part of fallen humanity. So Jesus comes as a real human one and lives a life as a real human one, does not fall and become a fallen human, but maintains being a human one, the true human one, right down to his DNA in his death, which then becomes a death for you and me. Because the wages, the price tag of sin is death. And yet, because he never sinned, he had no price of death to pay. So he paid it for you, paid it for me, which we'll talk about later in the creed when we talk about why he suffered and died. Jesus, the human one, took our place so that we could become human again. So in our creed, we set our heart in the truth that Jesus is the promised, anointed Christ and Savior. Our Savior and anointed Messiah. We also set our hearts in the truth that He is the Son of God, equal with the Father, God Himself, and a perfect love relationship. So that He loves and created out of love. We confess in the creed that Jesus is Lord, meaning we bow our knee to no other Entity except Jesus himself. And in doing so, that's where true freedom and salvation is found. And we confess in the creed that Jesus is the one who became real human. And therefore, as we read in Hebrews 4, he understands our weakness, for he faced all the same tests that we do, And yet he did not sin. And so we can come to him as one who understands what it is to be human. So Jesus is still asking us today, who do people say that I am? Who do you say I am? When you read about me, when you hear my story, when you hear my teachings, when you watch the way I interact with people, who do you say that I am? The church, from the beginning, right out of the confession of Peter, has continually confessed for 2,000 years when asked that question, we say, who are you? Jesus, you are His only Son, Our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Who do you say Jesus is? If that's what you confess, if that's what you believe, or if that's the decision you need to still make, it's when you come to that conclusion that you then join the church. Join in the confession of Peter. That's The rock upon which Jesus said he would build his church is on that confession. That is something the church cannot let go. We let go of this, we're no longer a church. Because it's on this that we come together. This is the most important. This is the confession of believers. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that this will be a confession that we will either renew in our life. Many churches, Lord, confess this every week. And I pray, Lord, that it will not just be words, but that this will become our Pledge of Allegiance. Lord, for those here that maybe are still not at the point of being able to understand this or make this their confession. Lord, I pray that they will not just walk away from this, but say, I need to begin to find out who this Jesus is. And they will begin, Lord, to explore and to find out, are you who Peter confessed you to be? Lord, I pray that you will lead people, guide people, that your Holy Spirit will move among all of us so that we can discover where true salvation is found and that we can know you as Lord, Savior, King, the true human one. Amen.